Well, thanks everyone for coming. It's wonderful to be here. In one of my early club moments, I got inspired by a pounding beat I hadn't heard before to climb up onto a black dance cube in the red, green, yellow, blue spotlights. And that's where I first heard the deep droning voice and the song that went, people are still having sex, lust keeps on lurking, nothing makes them stop, this AIDS thing's not working. This was high school. Often in the evening I was having sex with men in public bathrooms, but I didn't call it that. It was a secret world. At the clubs, I just wanted to smoke pot and drink cocktails and dance. I needed to get away from everything. That's what dancing was about. It wasn't true that all the denouncement had absolutely no effect but I could pretend when the floor was shaking with the bass. That was back when you knew the drug dealer was the one with the bleached white hair and the lunchbox with smiley face stickers on it. You didn't really have to hide your drugs yet, not even in DC, and I could just go crazy on the dance floor. It was my space, my place to go crazy. I needed that. At the beach with my sister, I played something by New Order from Technique. I was showing off all my dance moves. I mean, I didn't have special moves. I would just go with it. My sister looked at me like I was crazy. I said, that's how people dance at clubs. <laughs> and then we went out on the balcony with a boombox echoing off the cement leaning out to the ocean, and we danced for the echo for the cement, for the other balconies, probably not for the ocean as much, because by the time we remembered the ocean, we were just dancing. Later, after I got away, there was Kashmir's Brighter Days with that track clack, bringing you right into the vocal hold and then back to clack track, but always building. By this point, it was all about something clanky, something banging. Give me some horns, but mostly just that pounding bass, layering drums, or repeating sample, layering bass, pounding drums. Yes, yes, please, more, yes. <laughs> Screaming when the beat got knock you down, overwhelming and breathe deep, soothing at the same time. Or that sample came at the exact moment when you couldn't possibly handle it. Or just because you saw the wrong person at the right time. Or the right person at the wrong time. Or because there was something missing. I mean, there was nothing missing for just that moment with the sweat pouring down your face, your eyes bringing the beat into your body, your body taking it. Tonight, I'm thinking of going to this disco revival night even though I hate disco. Mostly because it's taking place in the basement of 1015 Folsom, and years ago I went to a club in that basement every Tuesday. It wasn't like the rest of the club all fancy, just a basement finished in a kind of unfinished way. With a low ceiling, like maybe you'd hit your head on the pipes if you jumped too high, and everyone would dance like crazy. It was a Tuesday night, so we were dedicated. And I'd always get that calm rush from dancing, except I remember standing outside at 4 a.m. after they closed, and all these people were getting into fancy cars, and I was trying to find a ride. No one would give me a ride. The club was called Together. <laughs> Then, just a few months ago, this guy on the bus asked me if I went out to clubs a lot. I used to. Then it turned out he remembered me from Together. He started going on and on about how it used to be all about the dancing. You could be anybody and just dance. It didn't matter whether you were straight or gay, who you knew or what you looked like. What kind of clothes you wore was all about the dancing. And if I let my eyelids flutter a bit, I can remember him too. He used to spin around and jump up and down. He was a straight guy who wasn't afraid. But then, 
there's that certain kind of nostalgia so specific to club life. Like you could take any horrible place and suddenly it was the place where everyone got along. <laughs> when the drugs were great, when there were no drugs, when the drugs were actually fun, when everyone was different, when everyone was the same. Before the straight people, the yuppies, the suburbanites, the tweakers, the tourists took it over, when the music actually built. It hit you over the head. It was soothing. It knocked you down. It was all about the vibe. When the DJs actually knew how to spin. When two hours was a warm-up, not a whole set. When DJs would play for the music, not for the crowd. When DJs would actually play for the crowd. When DJs <laughs> would actually spin spin records, when people would actually make out, when everyone wasn't just interested in sex, when there wasn't so much attitude, when there were freaks, when there was attitude, when people were interesting, when people actually had sex, when the music was actually good, when it wasn't about who you knew, when everything was cheap, when everything wasn't tacky. When you knew everyone, when people actually dressed up, when everyone wasn't so dressed up, when you could have a conversation, when the music wasn't so loud, when clubs actually had good sound, when people would stand in line, when there wasn't a line around the block, when they didn't frisk you, when things were safer, when everyone wasn't worried about safety, when people would talk to one another, when people had fun, when everyone got along. But anyway, I'm thinking of going to this disco revival <laughs> night. <laughs> Even though I hate disco, I like that it's in the basement of 1015, which I just heard was originally one of the big bathhouses in the 70s. So I'd like to look for evidence. Maybe those pipes. Plus, there probably won't be smoke. 1015's a big club with too much to lose. They wouldn't risk letting people smoke. A big club with only a few doors that seal like a fortress. And this night is in the basement, so there's no way for everyone's smoke from outside to get in. And even though I hate disco, I've heard these DJs can actually spin. <laughs> And there's actually one person in the room who I ran into on that night in that club <laughs> who's mentioned in the <laughs> um, So the first review actually that came out about this book was in Kirkus Reviews. It was a beautiful review and they mentioned, they described the book as an attempt to purge the demons from my past. Um, which I think is a great description. And <clears throat> on that note, I think I'm going to read just a brief section describing one of those demons um, that actually I had a hard time talking about for years. I, you know, I grew up in an upper middle class, Jewish assimilated family where educational attainment and status were the most important things. And so I internalized the notion that in order to get the fuck away you know, from the violence of my childhood and who I was supposed to be and my parents and the world around me, that I had to beat my parents you know, on their terms. So I had to go to a better college and you know, eventually I would move into a bigger house in the suburbs and I would live a life where I hated everything even more than my parents. And, <laughs> and then I would have won, right? So um, <clears throat> this is just a brief excerpt from what happened when I, uh, just a little bit of uh, going to that, that college that was better than the one that I went to, where I went briefly before moving to San Francisco. Elise and I learned a lot from taking ecstasy that was actually acid. <laughs> Although I wouldn't find out it was acid until years later. Katie sent it to me. She said it was joy, ecstasy in tab form, pure MDMA. And it was joy, the way you could see the structure of things, the structure you were trying to escape. One time Elise and I walked by one of those emergency fire alarm things and it fell over. 
crashed into the sidewalk. No alarm, and was there really smoke? Another time, we were gliding above the ground, and we made up songs for the cars. Don't run us over, that's bad, cause then we would be dead, and that's sad. Sad was one of the ways we connected. We could finally say it. Every day was another opportunity to break down, and to break down the breaking down. And this didn't necessarily feel hopeful, but it felt. We felt. We were feeling. Of course, we felt trapped in different ways. Late at night on weekends, we would often end up at Dunkin' Donuts, after whatever party ended and we were still high. We smoked a lot of pot. It made us crazy, and we loved that. We loved being crazy, so late at night, we'd end up at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I was eating things I would never eat if I wasn't high. I had outgrown anorexia, but I was still frightened by fat. What could be worse than donuts? Although they had muffins, too, I tried to stay with the muffin. <laughs> and we would smoke pot in the back of Dunkin' Donuts. Sometimes we would pass out there, and in the morning, people would come looking for us, our friends. If we left before morning, tripping over ourselves, and I would start to feel disgusting, back in my body the way I usually felt out of my body. I would hurl the donuts or muffins into the street, and I remember Elise was stunned that I would throw something away like that, something you could eat. I don't think she told me that, not right then. She was spending more on books than her mother had for food. Once her mother sent her a rug, a woven Guatemalan rug in the style that was very popular at the time for frat boys who drank Cuervo and wore ponchos, <laughs> a gesture of care, and I took one look at it and said, that is tacky. I might have even said, get rid of it. Or if I didn't say that, it's what I meant. When I first arrived at Brown, I felt a social ease that I'd never experienced before. This was one of the things that gave me a certain kind of status. Or maybe it was the other way around. Sudden social status gave me a certain kind of ease. At first I felt an intoxication from this shift, but then I began to feel like I was inhabiting a role that represented everything I'd always wanted to challenge. Elise and I were becoming an item for the disaffected kids on campus. The ones with dyed hair who studied semiotics. <laughs> Older students, they saw our confidence and came right up to us to, to befriend us, bring us to parties where only upper class students were invited. I mean upper class as in older. We were the new item, a prize traded for avant-garde cachet. I'd never been that kind of item before, and it made me feel grandiose and then emotionally dead. Elise and I would talk about who was crazy and who was insane. Crazy was good, but insane was even better. <laughs> One night, Elise saw the world in blocks, she was surrounded by blocks, fetal position on the ground, her eyes in permanent panic from a Robitussin high. When we were on mushrooms, I got scared because Elise was on a different level of reality. I wanted her to come back to this level, but she kept changing her sweatshirt and her expression. <laughs> you keep on changing, I will not know who you are. Elise left a note. Death is room temperature. <laughs> Maybe that was it. We were finally finding a place where we could be dramatic and then talk about it. My body felt like broken shards. I was ruining my life to beat my parents on their terms. I'd come to ground to look for activism. Instead, there was so much apathy. Why were people so apathetic? and scheming. Everyone was scheming like there was some high stakes game to find it. Find it now. It was me, us. Have you tried this yet? Try it. Everything in my life had been leading up to this point. I grew up believing that I was evil, that if anyone ever saw my true self, then they would know I was a monster that deserved to die. And I didn't want to die. 
except when I wanted to die. But I didn't want to know that, and so I knew that I always had to hide everything. I had to hide everything so they wouldn't know. They were parents and teachers and kids at school, grandparents too, and everyone else I might encounter. I wanted them to think I was perfect. Since I always did well in school, it was always assumed that I would go to a good college. I mean, that was assumed for everyone in my school, but some of us would go to college and some of us would excel. And I was one of the kids who everyone believed would always excel. This was childhood. I needed to do better, better than my father. He went to Oberlin Medical School, became a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist. I had to go to a more prestigious school, become more successful, buy a bigger house, make more money. This was the only chance I had, the only chance not to die. Except then I started to realize that was death too. That's when I knew I was trapped. <laughs> <laughs> Throw a last and just, just soften my heart. There's one chair over here in case anyone needs a seat. Feel free to come forward if, if anyone needs a seat. Um, so now I'm going to read um, a very short excerpt from the chapter called The End of San Francisco. Oh, it's interesting. So I'm doing several readings in the Bay Area, and I'm trying to create excerpts that are all different for every reading. And this very short excerpt is the only one that I might repeat, so feel free if you come to other readings. Yeah, yeah, This is from the middle of the chapter, and it um, takes place in the early 90s, here in San Francisco. We were scarred and broken and brutalized, but determined to create something else, something we could live with, something we could call home, or healing, or even just help. I need help here. Can you help? We were incest survivors, dropouts, whores, runaways, vegans, anarchists, <laughs> drug addicts, sluts, activists, and freaks trying not to disappear. We paraded down the streets in bold and ragged clothes too big or too small. We shared thrift store treasures and recipes and strategies forgetting day glow hair laughs. We exchanged books and zines and flyers and gossip, got in dramatic fights over politics, over the weather, over clothing, over who was sleeping with whom. We held each other, we painted each other's nails, and we broke down, honey, we broke down. <laughs> We were the first generation of queers to grow up knowing that desire meant AIDS meant death. And so it made sense that when we got away from the other death, the one that meant marriage and a house in the suburbs, a lifetime of brutality both interior and exterior, and call this success or keep trying, keep trying for more brutality. <coughs> but when we got away, it made sense that everywhere people were dying of AIDS and drug addiction and suicide because we had always imagined death. Some of the dead were among us, just like us, just trying to survive. Others were more in the distance. The elders we barely got to know, except as we lost them. We went crazy and cried a lot. Or went crazy and stopped crying. Or just went crazy. We believed it was us 
against them. They were straight people. They were abusers. They were rapists and landlords and cops. They were parents and politicians and anyone with designer clothes. <laughs> they were the gay people who congregated in the Castro. Apathetic, straight-acting gay men who went to the gym and dressed like clones in white t-shirts and baseball caps. Gay men who hated women and fat people and people of color and <laughs> sissies and anyone who was different, really. And we were different. We were absolutely certain of that. <laughs> Now I'm going to read a, long, a longer excerpt from that same chapter, and um, this takes place uh, in 94. Um, yeah, it's actually the end of the end of San Francisco chapter, which of course is the beginning. Um, yeah, and then we'll have time for questions, comments, clever, <laughs> <laughs> Garrett was someone who I definitely didn't trust. He would follow people around, mostly dykes. First it was Angie, who was one of Elise's friends, and then it was Elise, and Elise told me I was being judgmental because I said I didn't like the way Garrett would become whoever he was around. We'd had this conversation before. Who the fuck wasn't judging everyone all the time? That's what I wondered. But now, Elise and I were in a place where we didn't always know our relationship would survive. And it's true that I would take one look at certain people and make pronouncements. <laughs> She just wants to be friends with you because she doesn't have any sense of self. <laughs> He's a pathological liar. She's using you. He's just another clueless rich kid. She's a hipster. Hipsters were the enemy. We all agreed about that. <laughs> they were vapid culture vultures who didn't have any politics. They looked kind of like us. <laughs> so we had to constantly draw the boundary. <laughs> we were always talking about how hipsters were taking over. Soon, there wouldn't be anyone but hipsters in the mission. Why did you invite that hipster over your house. I can't believe you went to that hipster bar. We went to that party and it was nothing but hipsters. So we grabbed a few drinks and then turned right back around. We all cultivated critique. We were dogmatic in our alliances, self-righteous, in our beliefs. But the broader mission dyke culture that we called queer, so much of it was about loyalty at any cost. <clears throat> loyalty could mean safety, but it could also mean reenacting high school popularity contests and taking on the victor's role. High school was only a few years in the past for most of us, even if we might have been scandalized if anyone had mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> Accountability only occurred when people would get in dramatic fights 
And it was more about whose team was stronger or more popular than about what actually happened. I went to Seattle to get away, for a month anyway, to figure things out. My two biggest relationships were falling apart, and maybe also my relationship with the queer cultures I thought were sustaining me. I met Joanne at Cafe Paradiso, and right away we were talking about sexual abuse and rape and Crystal and how we were trying not to feel destroyed, and maybe it was finally working. And then I spent a month in a room. We shared a bed and it never felt crowded. How could that be possible? That's what I'm wondering now. Now when I can't sleep without everything arranged in the right way and then something always goes wrong anyway. But this was a different time. I would go to the cafe during the day to read The Courage to Heal while Joanne went to her phone sex job. She worked in an office with other women and office dividers. They were paid a wage instead of just commission, but it was only $8 an hour. When Joanne got home from work, we would cook dinner, or sometimes I would have already cooked. Huge stir fries with ginger and a homemade peanut sauce. Or if Joanne was cooking, then she used dill and cashews. And there was this way that we held each other, and we held each other's rage. That was the key, the key that made us, us. Seattle was different from San Francisco. Most people were actually from Seattle. <laughs> or somewhere in the general region. The whole city felt suburban. Even the neighborhood that white people were afraid of felt middle class. The counterculture kids looked like they bought their clothes at the mall. There actually was a counterculture mall with tiny stores <laughs> that sold things like piercing needles and tattoos and I can't even think straight t-shirts. <laughs> the apartment building where Joanne lived was on a major street, but it looked like something you would find on a suburban cul-de-sac with blue prefab townhome style apartments arranged around a parking lot. In Seattle, people would get in blowout fights about which cafe served the best coffee. And people would get dressed up to go to cafes. I mean, like they were going to a club, especially goth kids and ravers, and goth ravers. These were kids who couldn't get into most clubs yet, since Seattle was strict about IDs. There were cafes that stayed open until 4 a.m., and you could hang out all day and night without buying anything. That's because Seattle actually had a youth culture. Youth needs somewhere to go. A few times, Joanne and I went to Lambert House, the queer youth center, for dinner. And I was impressed. There were 13-year-old drag queens practicing runway. <laughs> Dykes with facial piercings who talked about running away. Kids who would show up with bruises on their faces covered up with makeup, and brag about all the clothes their parents were going to buy them. Once I saw this butch, clean-cut gay boy burst into tears because his parents were forcing him to join the military. He already looked like he was in the military <laughs> until he started crying. His parents showed up in a big white station wagon, and he got in. The strangest thing was in Seattle, I actually felt calm. People had always told me to relax. Whenever someone said that, I felt like they were telling me to die. <laughs> right then, just die. <laughs> I thought about staying in Seattle, but I didn't want to be running away. At one point, Elise called me and told me one of her roommates had decided to move out. I can't remember who it was, because there was one room where someone was always moving out. And Elise asked what I thought about inviting Garrett to move in. I said, no way in hell. But do whatever you want. <laughs> and when I got back, Garrett had moved in. That's how Elise and I were getting along. When I went into my bedroom, there was melted candle wax on the sofa. 
Garrett said, oh, that's Wax Z poured on someone at a party. They were having sex and it was part of the scene. He said scene like he wanted to make sure I knew he was there. Sometimes he looked like a six foot tall six year old who'd gotten into his punk rock mother's manic panic stash. <laughs> I felt like the sofa wasn't mine anymore. It was some awful thing invading my room. So I lifted it up and tried to push it out the window. <laughs> the window was big, but still the sofa wouldn't fit. So I dragged it downstairs and outside to the street. Everything was tense, and then Elise decided to leave. Maybe our relationship was over. Elise moved in with Angie, who was starting to wield a lot of power in our little world. She would hold court at parties with her tarot cards, telling people what to do. She saw it in the cards. <laughs> Angie was tiny and always wired. It didn't matter whether she was yelling or whispering, she knew how to make it a big deal. She wrote poems that were like rants, and when someone she liked performed at an open mic or at someone's house, or showed their art at the Dyke Cafe where everyone went for coffee and drama, <laughs> Angie would say, that was amazing. Sometimes it was amazing, but sometimes it was awful. Soon there was this group of dykes who followed Angie around. They were constantly congratulating each other on bad art and bad relationships and bad behavior that they thought was truly amazing. When Elise moved out, Angie decided I was abusive. So that's what her followers decided too. I didn't know exactly what Elise thought because we weren't speaking, but I felt like she had a right to be as angry as she wanted. But Angie and I barely even knew each other. The strange thing was that Garrett and I ended up becoming close. We would sit in each other's rooms and talk about our incest flashbacks and desire and our fathers and the masculinity we were horrified by. We talked about consent and whether it was really possible. Garrett couldn't believe I rarely got fucked and I couldn't believe he thought Getting fucked was the only radical choice. We got arrested for writing anti-police graffiti on a bus shelter. The ad showed a stick figure drawing with a gun, shooting other stick figures, black lines on a white background. Children draw what they see, and what they see is a crime. We made a necessary alteration, labeling the stick figure with a gun as a cop, and the victims as unarmed people of color. <laughs> and then we went to a nearby cafe. It turned out that some store owner called the cops, and since Garrett and I both had brightly colored hair, we were easily identifiable. We ended up in jail for almost two nights, first in a holding cell by ourselves, once they decided we had sugar in our pants. That's how they put it. I was grateful for that sugar once I took a look at the other holding cell. Everyone arranged on top of one another. There was a fight and someone started screaming and the cops ignored it. After a night in a blank room with those oppressive pale green walls, we ended up in the queen tank where everyone assumed we got arrested for prostitution. I stayed awake while Garrett dozed some guy in office clothes was screaming on the phone to his lawyer. He was the only one with a lawyer. Eventually, the cops took Garrett and me to separate interrogations where they tried to get each of us to say the other one was a problem. We ended up with time served in 40 hours community service. Maybe that's when we really bonded. Garrett made these Daglo stickers that everyone in our house loved. Single words like whore or freak, or vegan, or dyke, or fag, or queer, or something more complicated like queer, vegan, incest survivor. Garrett's favorite sticker said trash, because that's what people had always told him he was, white trash. But this was when white trash parties were really popular in the mission among people who hadn't actually grown up white trash. 
these were the people who had grown up kind of like me, and so I avoided them. Not just because of their white trash parties, but because I thought they would never know anything I wanted to learn. At the kitchen table, we would talk angrily about those parties, not just the fetishism, but the emphasis on whiteness. I remember those nighttime walks through the mission and underneath the highway, crossing into South of Market to go to Junk after it moved to the stud, and we all agreed it was over. <laughs> but I guess it wasn't totally over, because we still went there. Now there were straight tourists looking for three ways since the club got written up in one of the papers. The first time after I went to junk after I got back from Seattle, I was so worried about running into Z and how would I feel? And then he wasn't there and I could breathe. Until he was there. And I tried to talk to people and act like it was okay. I mean, like I was okay, but around their heads I was looking out for him until I was dancing and then it didn't matter. No, it still mattered, but I could dance like it didn't matter and then eventually maybe it wouldn't. I remember those conspiratorial walks down dark streets and past warehouses and how we were trying to prepare for whatever might take place. If you looked up at the sky, it would frame us. That's what I'm thinking now. Sometimes we looked, and sometimes we didn't. I can picture at least first, with their shaved head and bleached white hair, twirling in the dark, although really we were just walking. But sometimes walking can be twirling inside. Then Garrett and Andy, since Andy had moved down to San Francisco while I was in Seattle. We met for a second in Seattle when I was with Joanne, but we really met in my kitchen. And on those walks, gossip and nerves, trying to act nonchalant. Tall, skinny fags and dykes with bodies. There were others who joined us too, and then there was Joanne when she moved down from Seattle freshly emboldened by the nails she'd forced through her ears. Hardware always made the best jewelry. <laughs> Once Joanne moved in, I would go to her room when I was scared of my father's eyes, and then she started talking about the dirty old man she needed to picture in order to get off. There was no other way. She needed that dirty old man. She realized it was her father, and we would hold each other in that way that meant it was okay if nothing was possible, and it was okay if everything was possible, and then it was just okay. We would sob together, really sob. Z held me in that way too, but then it would fall apart. With Joanne, it felt like always. When Joanne and I were done crying, we would paint each other's nails and soak our hands in ice water. We would help each other with hair dye, the hard-to-reach places in the back, and then we would get ready to go out. Or get ready not to go out. It didn't matter, we still had to get ready. <laughs> Sometimes we, we would combine drugs that didn't quite feel like drugs. Black beauties that Joanne brought down from Canada, they were supposed to be speed, but they were so calm to us that we decided they were caffeine. Or we do ephedrine and Xanax. I stole a lot of Xanax from my father's medicine cabinet, samples from the company arranged in a big box. We snorted everything on a shard of an old mirror, because that's the way we liked it best. We were avoiding the drugs that squeezed us too hard, but still we wanted that burn. Then we go to La Rondaya for margaritas in the photo booth. Was there a photo booth at La Rondaya? <laughs> there was so much laughter as we would tumble around. In the kitchen, we would remind each other to breathe and to chew. We were trying to stay calm, but we also celebrated mania. We held each other and made carrot juice with ginger. And then, honey, we would dissect the drama. <laughs> the first person Joanne took apart was Garrett. 
She couldn't deal with the way he wanted her to be his mother. That's what he wanted from all the dykes in his life, and Joanne thought it was oppressive. That's when Garrett was getting really depressed. I mean, he was always depressed. We were all depressed, and that was fine or not fine, but it was a given. <laughs> Now Garrett would come into the house and slam the door, and I would try to get him to understand why Joanne was angry, but then he started slamming the door on me. After that, when Garrett would come into the house, Joanne and I would stay in the kitchen and continue laughing and making carrot juice. Maybe we'd even laugh a little louder. I don't know who decided this first, but eventually, it was Garrett and Angie and everyone around Angie who decided that I was evil and that I had possessed Joanne. It sounded just as ridiculous then as it does now, but it's really what they decided. Joanne made these cards that looked kind of like tarot cards. They said things like, I'm just another brainless woman. And don't ask me, ask Matt. And then Joanne made cardboard horns for me, and I wrote 666 on my forehead with lipstick. And when they all came over to help Garrett move out, I sat in the kitchen smoking and hissing and staring them in the eyes like the demon they wanted me to be. Joanne chased them down the stairs and screamed for the whole neighborhood. You're not feminist. You're not fucking feminist. You're just misogyny turned the other way. Another time, we both wore a 666 on our foreheads, and Joanne taped her mouth shut with duct tape, and we went over to the Dyke Cafe and handed out cards that said Val Valley Pep Squad. <laughs> we were trying not to feel silent. If they thought we were possessed, then why not show them possessed? <laughs> but I almost forgot the hardest part. I mean, the hardest part for me. No, I didn't forget. I was just trying to figure out how to tell it. When Garrett moved out, he spray painted the sidewalk in front of our door. Huge letters that said, Matt is a rapist. When I first saw those words, I stood there and stared and felt my whole body pull in. I didn't know what to do except to call Elise. I said, you won't believe what Garrett wrote on my doorstep. Here he was calling me a rapist just because it was the worst thing he could say. But Elise still refused to support me. Now I knew our relationship was really over. I didn't know if I would ever again believe in this thing called community. Even now, 15 or almost 16 years later, it's like I'm there again. I can hardly breathe. I'm on the phone with Andy, who says, I never realized all that affected you so much. But it did, honey, it did. At the time, I still wanted to be invulnerable, or at least to seem invulnerable, and so I channeled all my emotions into a politicized rage. Rage at this culture that had made and betrayed me. What do you mean, community? I dissected the betrayal step by step. I went off on scenesterism, on followers, on the emptiness of Mission Dyke posturing. But I didn't talk about how I believed. 